Go on 1030 now. Um, welcome to the Social Work Services Committee of Tuesday, 19th of February 2019. Um, I'll just uh, let you know that this meeting may be recorded and subsequently made available for the uh, public for listening purposes. And also, if you do have mobile phones switched on, if you could turn them to silent um, or make them otherwise uh, non disruptive for the purposes of the meeting, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, firstly, um, Sergeant, and apologies, please. Good morning, everyone. We have 17 members present. We are quorum, And so far, I have an apology from Councillor Dempster. Um, Councillor Juice, did you have an apology? Thanks, thanks, Chair. I've got apologies from Ronnie Tate and David Ingalls. I'll note those. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sloan is not present, but may be along later in the meeting, unless there's any apologies. Nope. Thank you. Um, do we have any declarations of interest from members? Councillor Carruthers. Ian. I, I know it's in statute, but I think I, I, I'll be consistent in regards to a member of the integrated joint board. There's quite a bit of the business is in relation to that. Not a conflict, but a declarable interest. I would see it in my eyes. Thanks, Chair. With that, then, if we go on to item three, which is the minute of the previous meeting of 4th of December, uh, and this is for approval. Are members minded to approve? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. So that takes us to item four, which is comments, complaints and compliments. So this is effectively an annual update from April uh, 2017 to 31st of March 2018 on our performance with regards to comments, complaints and compliments, um, as agreed at this committee in 2016 it was there. Um, so we've been asked to note, but we have here uh, Gillian McNish to speak to the report. Uh, Gillian, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Just a matter of clarity on page 11 for members' um, information. In terms of numbers, um, at 3.6, we recognise that there were 59 complaints, 26 of which were dealt at stage one. Seven of those escalated to stage two. And if we go over the page, it refers to the additional 30 that were actually dealt with um, through our triage um, procedures, whereby the service actually intervened at an early stage and were able to resolve it satisfactorily, and three fell out with the actual reporting period. So just in terms of numbers for you there, just for clarity. And a second point to note on page 14, with reference to the two posts at 3.22, just to, just to clarify, they are not additional new posts. This is resources um, already within the existing staff complement. Thank you. So open to members now. Do you have any questions? Councillor Bell. Uh, thanks, Chair. So obviously I mentioned you about 59 complaints and that from the period of 1st of April to 31st of March 2018. Uh, obviously we had a report of social work, uh, not social work, uh, audit, uh, audit committee the other day saying the council had over 300 complaints in general across the council. Compared to other local authorities of 59, wh where are we to other local authorities in Scotland? And where were we? Where, and it'd be interesting to know, was this an increase from 2016? Um, in terms of the increase from the previous year, no, we remain relatively steady in terms of numbers. Um, I don't have the specifics for you in terms of a national position, but our understanding from colleagues at SPSO is that actually we're performing pretty well um, against our peers. Um, it's also worth noting that actually, um, anecdotally, 0.02% of our customer contact results in a complaint. So just to keep that in context, we are dealing with really small numbers. Um, it may be worth um, just being advised that we could actually probably get details of like figures across Scotland. Is that maybe something the members would like to see just by email or something? Yep. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dougie Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, nothing specific in relation to the the body of the report. It, it's, it's more a question about the the um, the period of reporting. Um, 1st of April 2017 uh, to March 2018. It, it's you know we're quite a considerable period beyond that reporting period. Is it possible for the financial year that we're in to have this report earlier than February next year, just to make it more contemporaneous? Um, uh, well, f firstly, I mean, is, there a, is this just a sort of custom and practice we've got into, or is it, are we in a reporting cycle with this, or can that be a ch changed in any way? 
Um, it is actually in terms of just the cycle that we've naturally fallen into. So the last reporting period, obviously, this is the, is the, um, the next report, natural reporting period from that. Um, we are looking at the reporting at the moment and the systems that we use to do that. Um, so the figures actually can be made available. So, yeah, we can look at that and report more frequently if needs be. I'm, I'm getting a helpful voice in my ear here advising me that it could be done six monthly, um, which may be something that we can maybe consider. Um, if the committee... Yeah, if the committee is minded to get six monthly updates on this, then that would be okay. I think that's a, a sort of nodding of heads there, so we'll take that. Um, Councillor Ian Howey. Uh, thanks, Your I'm just uh, wondering what the difference is between a complaint and a communication of dissatisfaction. What's the difference between the pair? And how do you align which, where, where it falls, whether it's, a, whether it's a complaint or whether it's a dissatisfaction? Yep, okay, yep, absolutely, good point. Um, in terms of a complaint, it's where somebody actually um, has intimated to us that they want to go through that formal complaints handling process, at which point we take them into a timed process. So we have five working days for a stage one. It can then escalate to 20 working days or extended beyond that. Um, it's quite a formal process. Uh, some clients don't like the formality. Um, so what we tend to do is if they've expressed some form of dissatisfaction with the service they've received, we look to intervene. And that's what we call triage, effectively. We look to see whether we can have a conversation, whether we can signpost them. And sometimes it's literally just about um, being clearer in terms of our language and making sure that they understand the process that they're going through. So we tend to differentiate like that rather than taking somebody through a formal process, which can be quite uncomfortable or um, complex for them. We look at the individual needs and the requirements. And if we can resolve that, then we will do. Councillor Maitland. Where would I look to check exactly how integrated is our systems with other agencies? We're told in, in 317 here that uh, we continue to work jointly and clearly you train together, the staff train together, uh, which is excellent. Um, I hope it's across agency. Um, but um, how would we know exactly how integrated that system is? I can't answer that, but I think uh, Gillian may be able to help. Um, yeah, you're right. In terms of the training, it is absolutely across the, the NHS and Dumfries and Gallery Council staff. Um, and you'll see from the report, we've also extended that across um, CIPL. So we're looking at making sure that the, the training and the tools available to our staff across the directorate um, are consistent and the approach that we take to customers is consistent. We also talk about um, working with partners where there are other agencies involved with a client or a customer um, across all of the, the, the range of services delivered from CIPL and social work services. Um, we seek to ensure that they understand the complex needs of the customer and that we look to find joint resolution if that is appropriate. So ensuring that a complaint that comes in about a packaged service is actually communicated to those people that are affected in the delivery of that. So we can't, we recognise that we can't do it in isolation. So it absolutely has to be. In terms of finding out how to do it, we can give you numbers in terms of training, and we can also give you numbers in terms of complaints that have been received specifically to the integrated joint board. Um, but I believe that might be reported elsewhere. Please come back. Well, it's really just in, in terms of a, a, another agenda item, and I mean, I don't mind where it, whether it's taken now or, or later on, but I mean, we are going to have to prove that our systems are properly integrated and that we are delivering across the piece. So um, I'm really asking about how I could actually demonstrate to an external auditor, yes, our systems are properly integrated and, and the results show it. Uh, Councillor Maitland, it's just to say that in terms of the complaint process, there are two separate complaints processes. Clearly, the services that are delivered purely under NHS are complained through their system, and whether it's a social work service complaint, whether it's delegated or not, comes through our system. So part of the, um, the work in terms of the development of the performance reporting for both the IGAB and for this council, that is an area that we are looking to see how we can... Um, evidence and record both different schemes, but they will not come together. Um, there was an agreement when the scheme was set up uh, in terms of health and social care that they wouldn't be reported together. Councillor Carruthers, Ian. Just, just on the same point, my understanding, because we've took the corporate body approach, Lillian's absolutely correct, the, the, the two complaints processes should and will stay apart from each other, but 
I think the whole integration is absolutely right. What, what uh, Council of Meetings is, is talking about, how they should, the service delivery should certainly be integrated, but I think it's right that the, because of the, the approach we've took in regards to the corporate body, there should be two separate complaints processes. Um, with any, any further questions on that one then? Uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. Just with regard to training in 3.14, how many hours of training do we actually give our staff and is it done independently? Do we bring an independent trainer in or is it in-house training that they deliver? Um, okay, so the, the training itself is in two parts. So um, people can attend either the morning session or a full day session. We split it between a kind of complaints handling and then an investigation training because um, it recognises obviously that there's a slightly different skill set um, for those that are actually investigating the complaint at stage two. Um, so the training is roughly a day and we refresh that training as much as is required for the person to become confident and competent. We take the framework for the training from the SPSO um, and we directly engage with them to ensure that what we are delivering in-house is um, aligned with what they would expect to see. Um, but it is in-house training. We don't, we don't bring somebody else in to do it. And we do it across, uh, like I say, the NHS and uh, Dumfries and Galilee Council. Okay, with that then, um, if we go to the recommendations, 2.1 is to note the performance of the service. 2.2 uh, is to note the number of compliments um, received by the service. And I think uh, I'm getting the sense that a 2.3 would be that we're asking effectively an additional recommendation to get six monthly updates on the, on the, um, the figures for the benefit of the members of the committee. Now, how that fits in with the, the timing and how much after it is in terms of recording the event of the complaint or whatever, that's obviously something that we work through, but at least we can be more regularly informed. And similarly, I think there's an action which is to let members know uh, some benchmarking or comparative data, which is to do with how we compare in terms of the numbers of complaints with other local authorities across Scotland. Is that okay for members? Okay, thank you. So item five is a audit Scotland report on integration. Um, I think I'll hand over to Lillian to speak to this. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> members, I have provided just an overview of the Audit Scotland report. Um, I would wish to draw your attention to 3.3. Um, I just uh, probably my use of language, but I felt that these that were the recommendations that directly affected ourselves as a partner within the integrated um, health and social care partnership. Um, and clearly, I'm happy to take any questions from the report. I would also wish to open an invitation to members that there is a, a, um, an IJB workshop on the 15th of April at 10 o'clock where the auditor who undertook the, um, who, who is the auditor of the report will be coming down to Dumfries and Galloway um, and uh, if members wish to attend, if you would let me know, I'll make sure that you are added to that invitation list for that workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think the Chair and Vice Chair um, are um, looking forward to that event as well to attend. Um, so we've got Councillor Nicholson, first question. Thank you. Um, this, I've read this quite thoroughly and there's a lot of things that this Council and this Committee have actually highlighted in the past. Uh, a lot of things I agree with entirely uh, in this. And I think the main thing in here as well is um, how the actual uh, improvement, uh, people's outcomes are improved by the service we have and we haven't it's recognised in here that we didn't get that information in that place but the other difficulty I've got as well in this is that I don't know what nationally this is and where it is locally the complexity uh, are working together in between the NHS board and Dumfries and Galloway Council is off is, uh, different challenges than other councils have, because it all depends on the relationship we have within uh, Dumfries and Galloway. Another thing that I don't know in here about the auditor's report is, obviously this is a, a, a social work report, and auditors aren't social workers. They, I don't know how much they are steeped in the knowledge of how social work works, and what kind of weight I give to the, uh, you know, the recommendations or the, you know, the, uh, the statements about what's happening in different areas. But there's a lot in there that will probably come out in the discussions regarding, um, you know, the, the auditor's report. But 
Can maybe give us a wee bit of assurance about a couple of um, things that I've highlighted? Okay, thank you. Um, I think, uh, I mean, obviously that's part of what the Short Life Working Group that's going to be put together is going to try and tease out in terms of the relevance of the recommendations to Dumfries and Galloway and specifically what we can do to address or recognise how significant it is for us. But I'll let Lillian speak to that in more detail. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Nicholson. In terms of the national um, view and, and way forward, uh, there has been a group established where the Chief Operating Officers and the Chief Social Work Officers, so the 32 Chief Social Work Officers and the 8 Chief um, Operating Officers will meet regularly to go alongside uh, the auditor that, that undertook this um, review and we will work to, to look at um, addressing some of the strategic challenges that face uh, the Chief Social Work Officers in particular, who have the professional responsibility but generally not the operational responsibility. So there is a significant amount of work um, and the plan is that we will meet every six weeks to work through um, a number of the recommendations and outcomes within the report and there will be an action plan developed for that group which I'll be happy to share with the committee if if members feel that would be helpful. Um, and as the Chair has indicated, the, the local um, way forward is for a short life working group to work towards um, some of the areas that will be challenging for Dumfries and Galloway as we move forward. In terms of the um, auditor that undertook this um, review, she does have a significant amount of knowledge with regards to health and social care and some of the social work process, but absolutely she's not a social worker. She is an auditor, so that is always the premise that, that these reports will be published. I would, however, say that we had, um, there was quite a significantly high level advisory group that worked alongside the auditors um, during this process. And and um, whilst we recognise that some of this is very challenging for us, we do feel that it's a fairly balanced and robust report for us all to, to start to address some of the challenges that exist within the integrated process and um, how we deliver services. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ian and others, and then uh, Councillor um, Ellen Murray. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chairman. I, it's probably covered. Uh, I was going to just ask about the national picture in regards to the local picture. Maybe that's covered. I think recommendation 2.3 talks about having that updated report. I think all voting members are are uh, members of the short time, short life working group as well. So I think being on that, I think both Jane and I have been at the first meeting. Uh, we'll probably be at most of the other meetings as well in regards to it. But I think 2.3 is is it should be this uh, the focus. I think for what comes back, so what do we actually see, what is the local context, we'll maybe see that at that point. But I think it's quite interesting as, as, as not only a committee member here, but as a board member on the Integration Joint Board, what this committee feels about this whole this whole report, what, it, what does it mean to them? That's what I'd be quite interested to hear today, if I could possibly hear that from, from members, because we're in the thick of it, we understand it, but it is interesting from the social work point of view, we think it's important that the social work committee has teeth, it does as much of this type of interrogation and understand as it should, so Interesting that if if MD is willing to comment uh, out with the people who've commented already. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure that'll come out in the comments that follow. Um, leader, I was trying to say and then got confused. <laughs> Apologies. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, the reserves held by IGBs. I was a bit sort of shocked on page 29 to see the extent of difference in the reserves. But also to see that the IGB, the Fisher Galloway IGB, has reserves very similar to us as a local authority. They're not 1.9 percent and 6.8 million. It's very, very similar to what we hold as a local authority hold in reserves. And I note, noted actually from the accounts that there was two and a half million unspent in terms of the money uh, transferred to the IGB by the health board and uh, by the council. There was two and a half million of that unspent in 2017-18. And um, I see there's a, a note here saying that uh, the pressures on IJB budgets and the savings they need to achieve are significant. Well, actually, the IJB has actually had a rather better settlement than the local authorities have this year. And um, I just really wondered why, to an extent, why it is the IJBs are holding a reserve and the local authorities are also holding a reserve uh, for the IJB. Right, thank you, Leader. I think, I mean... 
it's very interesting information to see presented as part of the uh, supporting information to the report, but I think it's kind of obviously out with what this committee is actually able to make any meaningful decision about, other than to maybe find out a bit more information about it. So I don't know if Lillian, you want to maybe add a comment about that? Yeah, um, obviously I can't make any comment on the findings of the report, Leader, in terms of the, the auditor's findings. Um, we obviously have a financial officer um, who is part of the Health and Social Care Partnership, and I'd be more than happy to um, seek her views in terms of providing further information, if that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> it's, I suppose, uh, trying to answer... Councillor Crothers, and that is, uh, I would like to know just how responsive the IGB is locally, because this report came out in November. You're talking about you have a short life working group that meets every six weeks. Has it actually met yet? In terms of the national group, yes, it has, Councillor Wood, and the local group has started the process in terms of forming the membership and starting the process. The report wasn't actually published till December. So, yeah, it came out just, just before Christmas. And it was published in November, it wasn't released. Just, okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Carruthers? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, 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 so it was, it was, it was the first meeting after was in January. So they agreed, I was in at that one. They agreed that they would then take forward the short life working group. Not only is it formed, it's met as well, had its first discussion, and it's moving into its second and then its, its third phase. So I think it's, it's reacting as quick as it possibly can with the processes that it has to adhere to. Thank you, Councillor Woods. On getting that further information, clearly the IGB the board would have, a, would have had an idea that there were issues that needed to be dealt with. Could they have dealt with them at an earlier stage rather than having to wait on a report coming through, an audit being done? Just, is this on the same point, Councillor Crothers? It was, I think the, the problem with, with what Andrew's highlighting there, I think, is that we're looking at a national picture compared to a local picture. And that's what we have to iron out first. We actually have to understand what's happening here locally. And I'll say this anywhere I am, where I get the chance, that the Bruce and Galloway Integrated Joint Board is probably, if not the highest performing integrated joint board across Scotland. That's how I certainly see it. It's very high performing in comparison to others. Others are certainly catching up at a pace now, but we're, we're, when it comes to integrated joint boards, we do work well. Uh, that's no, that's just a matter of fact. That's how I see it. That's how Parliament sees it as well in, in uh, Holyrood. So I do think until we get this local picture, we understand then at that point, I would like to think that this committee would then get dug in and say, right, okay, this is what we, we think you need, you need to be doing as a council. Uh, Councillor Maitland, is it on the same point? No, not the same point. Uh, Lillian, are you wanting to maybe uh, make any comment on that? Okay. I mean, I think I'd maybe reiterate that um, in 2.2, effectively, exactly on the, on the same theme as you're talking about, we are trying to uh, extrapolate, I suppose, from the audit report what it is that's actually relevant to Dumfries and Galloway um, and that's that's what we'll be bringing back to the April committee, at least the sort of first workings out of that, so we'll have a better understanding in terms of locally. Um, Councillor Nicholson. Yeah, just on, it was just on that same point. I think there are things in here you can extrapolate from it, and one of them is that um, how the NHS, how the uh, working with the NHS boards, IGB working with the NHS boards and the council when they're do, when they're um, you know doing away with services. And the prime example of that was the dentist at Lockside, and it's saying this, um, this includes working with the NHS boards and councils to agree. Well, there was no agreement from us regarding services, and that's one, one item that's highlighted, and I think that's an important part of it, not just to, for the history of it, but going forward. I think it is important that we do have that, uh, you know, that conversation and agreement on how services will be going forward before they actually do away with them. I'll, I'll let Laura maybe add something to that so we get a better understanding locally. For, all examples exactly like that. <coughs> Councillor Nicholson, this will be um, part of the, the short life working group and also um, I take the point that there was much work being done before the Audit Scotland report so we've recognised a learning um, from some pr previous experiences and in terms of clinical and care governance and some of the work that the, the board has been doing and the, the, those of us that are involved in the partnership, we absolutely are looking to ensure that elected members are fully appraised of, of decisions being made before they are put forward for recommendation. So we are working on that. I think it's not just about being appraised, 
because it actually says in here, you know, includes working with NHS boards and councils to agree which services. So, so I think that's that's an important distinction between that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Maitland. You've been waiting patiently. Um, thank you. Um, I mean, far be it for me to, to annoy Councillor Nicholson. I'd really try not to annoy <laughs> Councillor Nicholson. I promise you. But <clears throat> but we must remember actually that the council never had any responsibility for dentistry at all. Um, and, and so we, we've got to sort of remember um, uh, uh, what, what the services were that were drawn together. I think it's really important, though, that people are told what the options are and can make, make provision. Uh, and as far as the information is concerned, I'm totally with you on that one. And I'm also totally with you that um, people should be given the information so that they can uh, um, properly contribute. Um, what I wanted to... to to sort of say, um, uh, to build on, on what Councillor Carruthers was saying, um, is that it's incredibly important that um, this committee really does get a handle on, on what's going on with the IJB and really influences, um, because what we really need from this committee is to think hard about how we are actually demonstrably providing properly integrated services to provide better outcomes for our people. And at, at the moment, um, I mean, Councillor Carruthers um, and, and I are in consultation with our opposite, uh, opposites um, in the NHS, uh, in the audit system, to, to work out what could usefully be done in terms of internal audit to think about whether or not integration is really working. And I'm, I'm not talking about services, I'm actually talking about um, um, the, the individual services. I'm talking about the systems, um, and to be to be sure that that is working on the ground. Uh, and the the it's on page 39 of our papers here, part two, with these six features supporting integration. Um, and, and and I think we need to, as a committee, probably maybe contribute to thinking about how this. Um, how this is going forward. At the moment, you'll see the ability and willingness to share information is one of the, the strands, um, and, and we've been working on that um, uh, through the, the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. We've been trying to push that forward. So um, I, I would actually really say to this committee that we, 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 we rely in many ways upon your helping us to come forward and make the whole process of integration be a plus for people. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I support Councillor Carruthers in his in his wish to to involve people and to have their input, um, and really I suppose to help us challenge and assist officers in feeling confident that this is what we want to have happen. We don't want parallel systems. We want things to be together. And I know that you just talked about two parallel systems working. Uh, uh, um, in the comments and complaints process, but if I was a family who, argue, for argument's sake, had an old lady discharged from hospital and she was discharged without a catheter when she was meant to have a catheter, who would that family complain to? It wouldn't be obvious. If they had one place to go and say, look, this isn't right, they would be able to, I think, probably uh, be assured that the system was going to address their complaints. So I, I, I'm really saying let's keep looking at it from the point of view of the, uh, the punter out there on the ground, but from our point of view also think about how we can best support officers to feel confident that they are going in the right direction. Thank you, Councillor Maitland. I think there's a number of things in there. Um, I think Lillian's may be able to speak to one of them, especially in particular to the, the safely sharing data. Um, and I think you're right to sort of highlight that sometimes it can be um, uh, different professional systems running in parallel, but to the, for the purposes of the, the end user, if you like, or the service user, it doesn't need to appear that way. There could be, there could be at least a perception of like one point of contact, but then once it's in that door, then there's two separate systems. Maybe you have to deal with that for professional reasons. So I'll hand over to Lillian on that. Uh, thanks, Councillor Maitland. Just to say in terms of the, the data issue, we are currently running two test sites, so that's already commenced um, out of ours and one of the adult teams in Annan, so we will um, 
we will be confident that there'll be a positive outcome and we can roll that out to, to all the services. In terms of the example that you gave, um, you know, the, the service user would, would probably make a complaint to whoever they felt was the right way to do that, and then we would make sure it, it went to either one, whichever one of the processes. So that example would be an NHS complaint, because that would be a, a role for, for a delegated member from the NHS side of the service. But if that had come into social work, we would make sure that we transferred that to, to that NHS system, not the service user. So whilst it's um, sometimes challenging, it's, there are mechanisms in place to make sure it goes to the right place. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McClelland. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair. It's in response to Councillor Crother's comment earlier and um, the content of the report. Obviously, it's an Audit Scotland report, and uh, the difficulty that I have is picking out what relates exactly to Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm pretty sure that's the case for everyone. There is a couple of small snippets in there. So that would be my first comment, Ian, that this it is an Audit Scotland report, and we, we can't really relate this to ourselves here in Dumfries and Galloway. So I really would welcome the... Um, the feedback and the outputs from the Short Life Working Group. I think that will be important for us to further understand what's actually happening here, because this doesn't tell us what's happening in Dumfries and Galloway. And just a point on the feedback, the auditor feedback on the 15th of April, which I think is on Monday at 10 o'clock, that falls bang in line with when the administration group meets on a Monday morning. So that's rather disappointing. I don't think I personally would be able to attend that, and I can understand why the chair and vice chair would be there, but it doesn't allow the administration group to be in attendance, so I really think that's, uh, um, although the invitation was there, Gillian, I, I really don't think it's something that many of us would be able to take up. Could I just confirm that was the dates given by Audit Scotland? So unfortunately we had no control over that, but I will um, happily go back and see if there were maybe another time they could attend, but that is the date that they have currently provided. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gregor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I totally echo what Councillor McLean McLean was saying. I think for me, knowing that this is a national overarching report, that's absolutely fine, and I can take out of that what I require to... I think from a local level going forward, particularly with the short life working group, what we need to see as elected members is much more tangible um, on the ground delivery of service. There's a lot of big words in there, agree local responsibility and accountability, support councillors. It's, you know, it, it's all appropriate for a national report, but it means absolutely nothing to me in a Dumfries and Galloway context. And as an example, I didn't know that the handyman, uh, sorry, handy van service was part of the IJB's function. You know, I, I still thought that that sat somewhere else, and I think it would probably be very useful to members, and I apologise if I've missed a seminar or a, a, you know, a previous report, to see exactly what has been taken into the IJB that the Council was previously delivering through community services, social work, and the such like. Uh, and I think that anything that comes forward in the future if we can see exactly what that service is, as I say, it refers to outcomes for service users and desired outcomes, and I don't know what services they're, they're referring to here. There's a few examples ac across Scotland of what it's delivering on the ground, but to me in Dumfries and Galloway, I don't know what's happening in Lockerbie or Annan or Moffat or, you know, it, on a local context. I need to see a list of what's been incorporated within the IJB um, and, and what sits there so that I can say, you know, if a, if a service user comes to me, oh, that's the IJB's responsibility. Um, so I think that would be useful through the Short Life Working Group is an understanding for members of what has gone into that bigger pot and that bigger delivery outcome. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I'm taking on board and it's, it's coming through loud and clear that um, what we really want to see back here in the April committee as part of the short life working group's uh, um, work is to actually get that detail insofar as it's relevant to Dumfries and Galloway and exactly what you've said there which is um, well exactly what is it that, that yeah so um, Lillian maybe you want to add something to that um, what, what we can do is actually do a list of services um, and the areas that are, that are covered I'm happy to do that Councillor Nicholson again Alex, that was very interesting, uh, Gail, and you know, one of the things you highlighted there was uh, the handy van, and 
I notice it is in here, but it's uh, I'm still under the understanding. It might be an IGB uh, service if you want, but the council actually pays in other money on top of that, and so therefore we do, we do, we do have an in, an interest in it and as a council, not just an IGB. Uh, and how, if they're providing them services for the IGB, why are we then topping it up from the council? But anyway, the the, the other thing was, in, I, I want to reassure Councillor Maitland, she didn't annoy me. On <laughs> uh, the contrary, I think it, it highlighted how understanding how the IGB works and how the finances and that within the IGB works is very important because, you know, I, I still kind of get my head around it after, after years. And the one, one thing I did, you know, mention about and I gave, I gave the dentist as, a, as, as an example, uh, but I think there is more examples than that. And that, I know you say that dentists have nothing to do with uh, the social work, but I think they have, because you then went on to talk about integrated services, and I think that's part of it. An integrated service, so the child's health as a whole uh, is, is taken care of, and that then impacts on the social work services. So I think, you know, that, that kind of understanding that, uh, and that kind of conversations is very important if, uh, if we are serious about taking it forward. Uh, thank you. In terms of uh, further members' questions, do we have any more? McGregor. McGregor. Yeah, it's just to piggyback on Councillor Nicholson. I think he's absolutely right. I mean, it, we talk about health and social care and, and integrated joint boards, but actually it should be renamed health, social care and well-being, because well-being is part of that wider agenda. And we know that, for instance, as an example, that dental health can be a great indicator for other services as to the health of that child. So it all has to be taken in context and in the round um, as part of a well-being agenda. And I, and I think the difficulty is that we get very stuck on the health and social care, and health we assume is acute, and social care we assume is caring for granny in the home four times a day. But there's a much wider well-being agenda that is in there, but again, is not getting picked out because we're not able to find it in a tangible way. You know, it, it's just fairly overarching at the moment. No, oh, it's a it's a interesting point. I think it's um, we're getting strong beyond the bounds of what this committee can actually do. But uh, Councillor Maitland first. We. We are, I, I agree with you, but nevertheless, it's all about systems and integration, um, and, uh, and I think actually it's been a very interesting um, debate, uh, really showing where people's different perceptions and understanding and, and uh, focus is. Um, I mean, I, I am reminded again that um, we do have opportunities, and particularly the system that Dumfries and Galloway put together is that it, it chunked everything up into localities. So members should have the opportunity of attending locality meetings with the locality manager to discuss exactly the sort of individual ward-based important services that happen for their people in their wards. Um, and, and that, I think, is maybe something that we are not perhaps absolutely capitalizing on, uh, the opportunity that is there. So I, I just like to sort of kind of stick that in as something that has emerged, maybe, from, um, from this discussion today. Thank you. So, and certainly, yes, I think at previous committees we have uh, directed members to consult with the locality management team um, on certain matters. But um, in terms of what we've got in front of us, um, we've been asked to, we, I think we've... Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, Councillor Ian Carruthers. Okay, no, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for allowing me to come back in. I just I thought it was interesting when Councillor Mayton spoke about page 39. If you look at that, you see your six points. And interesting as well, Councillor Nicholson used an example, being the, the, the dental care in uh, North Western Fries. And I think if you look at agreed governance and accountability arrangements, and, and you've got meaningful and sustained engagement as being two boxes, should we be referring, maybe it's too late in the day, maybe we need, we need, need to re read a bit more, but when it comes to the recommendations, the reason I'm bringing it up now, should we be looking at it in, in a structured way and say, actually, we would like the short life working group and recommend that back to them soon as to be looking at X, Y, or Z or any one of them six boxes or all six. Should we be paying a particular focus where this committee thinks there's a weakness or a strength? Or I just wondered, maybe it's beyond the realms where we are today, but I don't know. It's, it's just when I'm listening to the conversation, I would have picked up the two points. I think Ronnie's absolutely right to pick up on that as an example. And that's the two points where I thought there was a weakness. I think it's probably been recognised as has already been alluded to earlier, but 
should we be, be being quite explicit in our recommendations as a committee? Thank you. I'll let Laura maybe capture a couple of the things that we can represent, because this is an IGB body, effectively, um, but we have a, a role to play in that. Yeah. Uh, certainly, um, if members wished that that was the way forward, I can certainly take that back as a recommendation to the Short Life Working Group. Um, and absolutely, uh, the importance of the sharing of the agreement and accountability is an ongoing piece of work, but I can certainly reinforce that in terms of the importance for the group. Um, and, and clearly, that will be a decision for the group to make, but um, I can give that representation on behalf of Social Work Committee and elected members if, if the, the committee wished me to do so. And um, I'm taking that we would like that representation to be made, <coughs> excuse me, by our Chief Social Work Officer at, the, at those short -like working group meetings. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so if we go back to um, the recommendations that we have in front of us, 2.1 is to discuss and note. I think we, we have done that uh, well today. 2.2 is to note the establishment of the group. Clearly, um, we see the value in this. Uh, so that's for noting. And 2.3 is to agree that the update report and the progress of that, given the representations that will be making um, from, from this committee to the group, uh, and also I think what we're asking for is a detail or detail of um, effectively a list of the services that we um, have within that, uh, that, that affect us in our localities. Um, is that something you can maybe firm up, Lillian, in terms of like the details? Uh, certainly, my, my um, view would be that this um, agreed update report on the progress of the Short Life Working Group, including appendices, um, which provides members with detailed information on the services provided under the Delegated Health and Social Care Partnership. So if we're happy with that, to come back to the April Committee, um, then we'll, obviously that will then give us more details about how the audit report actually impacts on Dufferin and Galloway and what we need to see in order to take things forward. Are we happy with that? Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, so uh, now we're on to item six, which is directions issued to the local authority by Dumfries and Galloway Integration Joint Board. Um, I think we have uh, Heather is going to lead us through this. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add at this time, Heather? Um, I suppose what I've done is just tried in the report to set out the context of directions, um, particularly in terms of the Scottish Government guidance. Um, and that relates particularly around how the IJB will deliver on the Health and Social Care Strategic Plan. So that's the key purpose. Um, and that sets it out really clearly in terms of how that sits within um, what we're trying to achieve. What I've also tried to do as well is give you um, an indication of where we're currently at with directions. So the list of directions that have currently, up to now really, um, been set, um, as well as then give you an idea of um, the way in which we want to monitor going forward in terms of the delivery of these directions. So we're given the direction and then the idea, but in terms of the partnership, we'll deliver on those. And we need as a local authority then to be assured that that delivery is in line with what, what you as elected members and what we as professional staff would expect to happen. And I suppose just to point out for your information, there's a series of um, appendices, one of which is the draft guidance um, that the IJB have yet to approve, which is the local guidance in terms of how um, directions will be issued. But Appendix 2 actually does set out for you the list of functions that have been delegated from this authority to the IJB, and that includes the list of services as well. So I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thanks, Heather. And that's uh, good to know that information's in, in this report, even if it's not in the last one. Um, so do you have any questions? Uh, Councillor McClelland. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. He Heather, the Section 315 lists the directions that have been issued to the, to the Council. And as we go over the page to 316, 17, 18, we talk about the monitoring. And I know you've just said there that you've, uh, the report's really highlighting the directions and that monitoring needs to be in place. But these directions were for 2017, 2018. And as we mentioned earlier on one of the previous agenda items, we're into February of this year, which is, um, well, 
almost at the end of the year, and we aren't seeing the monitoring of the progress. And I, I really do uh, believe that as a committee, we should be seeing where we are. Um, we're not even seeing that just now. We should be seeing that before now. And I, I really think there should be uh, a progress report against these directions so we understand, as this committee, where we are actually sitting against these directions that have been put back to the Council. Thank you. I mean, clearly the, <coughs> the directions we already have, I'm sure <coughs> the officers here would be able to summarily update how we've progressed against those, uh, but clearly we've not had that formally reported back as a committee. So, I mean, obviously, Councillor McClellan makes a good point. I don't know if you want to address that, Heather. Yes, I think we'd fully acknowledge that um, we probably would have preferred to have this report into you much earlier. Um, but just in terms of the sort of the progress and the development of the IJB itself, in terms of, of the appointment of their governance officer has been really key in the bit about at what point were we putting the directions in. So you, again, you'll see that the guidance, the local guidance for the IGB is, is still in draft um, in terms of how directions will be issued. So unfortunately, it's, it feels a bit like we're playing catch up in terms of actually this is where we need to be and actually this is our current position. And then once we get past that, Absolutely, we'd want to be bringing you reports that actually allow you to see this is what we're doing in relation to this direction, this is the progress it's making. So that would be the intention. I have suggested um, in the recommendations that we brought you an annual report, but I know that perhaps there's a few, perhaps that needs to be more regular than that, and that would be absolutely fine. But we certainly could bring you a fairly early report in terms of giving you sort of a flesh and I just suppose really the current ones that we've got here in terms of you having an overview of, of what progress has been made in relation to those. Councillor Nicholson. Right. I don't know if it's just me that's confused about things in here, but um, the, part, of the, part of the issues for me is we are, you mentioned, Heather, about directions and it's come to the Council and you know, we, car we carry out these directions on behalf of the IGB and uh, the, the, the resources, for example, would be highlighted and then we have a discussion on that and uh, see a way forward. But we can't appeal a direction. So how does that how does that work together? I suppose the assumption is that actually we've delegated the services to the partnership to deliver on our behalf, and the direction is about giving clarity around actually what is the detail of what needs to be delivered in relation to both the delegated function and service and the budget that's been put against that. And I suppose it, it is then actually that then when it does come, yes, we need to note it and accept it, and that's what's actually being delivered in relation to that envelope of money, as it were. Um, and that's where the progress back reports are about us being assured that actually that's being delivered in a way that we feel is, is acceptable and actually meets the, certainly the statutory requirements in terms of a number of those directions. Apologies, Councillor Nicholson, I want to come back. But if it isn't acceptable, uh, we've still got to carry it that direction. I, uh, sorry, um, if I let Laura in, just to, because obviously she'll have a, a professional input at the IGB level. So, uh, Councillor Nicholson, the, the, the use of directions and the agreement of directions is discussed at the, the board. Um, and obviously, I'm there as a professional advisor, so I would have. Um, an opportunity to challenge whether I believe that direction could be delivered upon or not, and that's my professional duty as the Chief Social Work Officer representing the local authority. Well then, and I've got great respect for you, and I've got, I, I know you won't fight, fight the corner within that, but I think we've had this discussion before about your professional advice and judgement and how they can just ignore it. I think we've had that discussion before, and that might be the case, and we still go back to the council. And I think this is where the, where the trust comes in for the, 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 the partnership, and we won't be taken seriously uh, within that. And it, it doesn't appear to me to be at that stage. It might develop through this through the last report and uh, further conversations than that, but, but I don't think we're there yet. And as I said in the previous support, I don't think we've well, I don't have a, a proper understanding about how the finances actually work within that and the IGB and the council's responsibility within that. For example, if the direction is put to the social work to carry out whatever it might be, then and the resources have been highlighted uh, to do that and you know 
we're not happy with that as, as, a, as a social work department, then are extra resources or other things being put in place to actually do that that's taken away from our side of things? If you want, from other departments, it's not integrated to the joint board. That, that type of understanding would be uh, helpful for me anyway. And if I could just clarify that any resource linked to directions would come from the delegated service budget as a whole, so it would come out of the health and social care partnership pot. Um, and actually, as you move through the direction, if you believe that there's not enough resource connected, then you have the opportunity to go back to the health and social care management team, the clinical and care and governance, and ultimately the integrated joint board. So the, the, uh, as the chief social worker officer, I can go back and say that elements of this direction are undeliverable if indeed we believed that that were to be the case. And would it require any extra resource? Then that would be um, a bid that would be made to the partnership. No, it certainly wouldn't come from other elements of the social work service directions relate absolutely to those services that are delegated. Thanks very much for that. That's cleared uh, that part up. And it's kind of harks back to the last support as well that, you know, that there's, um, you know, officers need to have more time and, you know, do this and do that for the IJB. But um, obviously that, that, has, that would have a cost to the, the, the social work as well through time and that. Now, I don't know whether the IJB budget that we pass over to the IGB from the council has that included as a for like uh, as part of the budget, or is it a separate thing? You know, we are you're maybe doing a job for um, the IGB, or other officers doing the IGB, or finance are working together, and how that kind of works in the budget. Certainly, in terms of the the funding element, that the the local authority have handed over is absolutely for all adult services. Uh, clearly, when it comes to Heather's post and my post, then that is part of the local authority's responsibility for the professional overview. But any other element of the delegated budget that, that is um, with regards to adult services has been given over to the Health and Social Care Partnership. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ian Carruthers. I'd probably just try and pick up, and I think Ronnie raises some relevant points, but it's, it's complicated. It's, so I think the funding thing, I think, the way it's being explained to us as board members is the council receives the money of the Scottish Government, so to speak, as well as its taxes, uh, what it raises, hands it to the IGB, and the IGB hands it straight back. It's almost like a paper exercise. So the council, in real terms, still have that budget. But I think it's important for this service committee to do exactly what I think Ron is pointing out. That's it. Okay, if there's a direction comes forward and there is a resource issue or whatever there may be, we're not happy, this committee, this council isn't happy with that direction, then there's an appeal process that can be either, it can be exhausted in real terms and go through it. And whatever the outcome is to that would be the final outcome. And that's how I would see it. I think it's an important part. And the only reason I'm coming in is because I think that is a real important part for this committee and the council. So as, as this committee goes forward, and it grows its teeth, so to speak, when it comes to that. The Integrated Joint Board will have such an influence on the decisions, what's happening within adult social care, that the Council is responsible for the operational side of that, even though it works for the Health Social Care Partnership. I just think it's... The, the whole point that Ronnie's bringing up in real terms, for why it's complicated, it's so important to this committee, we have to get it right, and it's worth that level of debate. But I think the funding stuff, maybe... A wee bit to the side, because that money does come back to the Council, but the, 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 we, we may end up at some point, if we didn't get a due diligence right as a board when I'm saying this, was an integrated joint board, if they don't make the decisions that align uh, to what the council's thinking, we'll end up going through this appeal process at some time. That probably will happen, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes on, but this committee needs to be absolutely aware of, of its duties, I think. Maybe we need to look at our terms of reference and delegation to make sure it's exact and we fully understand it as we move into this kind of new world. But just before you... Before you I'll just sort of acknowledge uh, Councillor Carruthers' point there. Um, I think that's exactly why this report is timely, because effectively up to now, we've had no, uh, I suppose, official reporting mechanism in terms of how well we as a local authority are delivering against the directions um, that have been set us. And I think that 3.16 in the report uh, outlines that from our perspective, we need to get the assurance 
from our perspective, that we are fulfilling our role uh, and tied into that, obviously uh, you'll see in the recommendation 2.3, and this is what we'll eventually be looking at, is that um, it's appropriately supported through delegated resources. So, I mean, uh, yes, Councillor Nicholas is right to highlight that point, and uh, that's been uh, made clear, but I think that's exactly why this report is, is here, and it might be that it should have come sooner, but this is where we are the now. So um, given the, the background that Heather's given in terms of the appointment of governance officers and all the rest of it, we have it in front of us today, and th thank goodness. So we can actually move on on a basis which is actually going to be allowing us to be better informed. Um, but I'll maybe, do you want to maybe add something to the comments that have been made so far? Um, I, I just want to reassure members that, you know, that it has taken some time for these directions to be fully embraced in the partnership, and that is as a consequence of a delay in the governance officer for the health and social care partnership. And now that we have them, and we're very clear uh, the importance of this committee being given assurance, being given the information, um, and clearly where there are resource issues, then um, we, we absolutely have a responsibility to raise that through the correct process. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, Councillor Murray first, and I'll, yeah, I'll let you back in afterwards. Well, do you want to defer to Just on that point, it's what Councillor Cliver said, and I think we are moving forward with the, the, the governance issue. I think we are moving forward in that way. But it does say, you know, directions received from the IJB may not be amended, ignored, appealed, or vetoed uh, uh, for any direction. So it is a, it's something that concerning, you know, within there. That's noted. Councillor yeah, I have to apologise, uh, Chair, for being a bit of a budget bore at the moment. <laughs> But um, I'm just a bit puzzled by, on page 75, and it's, admittedly this is actually given as an example because it's part of the process for issuing and revising directions, but it says, should an overspend be forecast in either of the operating budgets for health or social care, the chief officer will need to agree a recovery plan to balance the overspending budget. And it then goes on to say this may require an increase in payment to either the health board or local authority funded by either utilising the underspend of the other part of the operational integrated budget or utilising the balance of the general fund of the IJB. It doesn't say anything about utilising the reserves of either the health board or the, the council. So I'm, I'm, again, I'm a little bit puzzled as I think this little, here's why we are, we are holding within our reserves some reserves for the IJB, admittedly from the social work side of it. But that looks, that reads to me as if if an overspend was was forecast in adult services, for example, the IGB would have to basically find it from its own resource. I'll, I'll hand over to Lillian, but I think clearly this is, what we've got in front of us is a draft. Okay, so I mean this is our opportunity, I suppose, to feed that back in and ensure that um, the clarity we need, you know, just as partners, is um, th that can be sought for and asked for, and Lillian will be there, I would imagine, to feed that back in and represent our views from this committee. So. I don't know if you want to maybe add to that, Lillian. Again, I'm happy to, to seek absolute clarity on that, but you know, it, it's very clear that the delegated budget are the, is the element of budget that the Health and Social Care Partnership can access. They could not access any other elements of the social work services budget um, in terms of children, families or business. So that is the delegated element. Um, and also there is a responsibility under the scheme for the local authority in terms of budget that was agreed um, at the implementation of the scheme. Uh, Councillor Crowther, is Ian? Apologies, that's the last time I'll come in. But just on that last very, very point, I think what uh, the leaders raised is the, the, the agreed process at this moment time when it comes to budget, if we were to, if the integrated joint body could say was to overspend in adult social services or the NHS side, then because we've, we've agreed the corporate body, approach that each the each partner would would stump up so say for instance we took a the council took a saving in regards to adult social care services this year through the budget process if they were to overspend over the year the council would still be responsible for that funding allocation not the integrated joint board it is complicated we've had lots and lots hours and hours of discussion but uh, it the penny does drop it after a number of hours it does eventually drop and it's it's worthwhile that pain i think again through that to understand it Okay, well, um, if we are ready, I think we could go to the recommendations. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. 
Fine. It's just following on from Councillor Nicholson's point, um, and I think he's covered or elaborated on the phraseology on 73 of amend, ignore, appeal, or veto any direction, which I think is a fairly important paragraph or sentence. And it's in relation to delivery partners. Now, we're assuming that our delivery partners are highly skilled professionals that are, are delivering a service within their remit and their direction. But if they don't have that mechanism to bring forward better ideas or a better way of delivering that service or something isn't working, presumably that's a, a discussion between the delivery partners and Lillian, who would then escalate it to the board in respect of if an element is undeliverable or if our delivery partners think it could be done in a different and better way. Because it sounds really restrictive um, within that sentence that our, our you know, trusted and uh, respected delivery partners seem to have no mechanism at the moment to indicate if something is, could be done in a different way. If I could just confirm and tell it to members that at 3.7, that would be the purpose of the forum. So th th those um, aspects of our monitoring would, would clearly indicate if there were issues in delivering the direction, and that would be the purpose where we would raise that and take that forward. I thought you said that was the last time, Ian. I did, I did. But just when I read that, I mean, explicitly, but there is a mechanism, I'm sure, that is in place that where both parties aren't happy, with the decisions of the IGB, whether it's direction or strategic plan, whatever it may be, there's a process that involves ministers that they can go through, and, appear, and it's long, contrived, and so on and so forth. That is my understanding. That may or may not supersede that, but I, I'd assumed that it would. But I think in, cap, in, in normal circumstances, a direction would be handed over in consultation with the council, NHS, so on and so forth. The, the private uh, voluntary and independent sector as well, there's a whole load of organisations there, but because we're talking specifically about the budgets. So we'd consult with everybody, integrated joint board, we'd consult with just everybody who they possibly could. That's an improvement, that the path that they're on at this moment in time. But I do think it, the actual, the ministerial processes would supersede that if it came to it, if the council re really was not happy with what, was, what the integrated joint board was directing them to do. Yeah. Hey, do you maybe want to add something to that? I suppose to point out that in 3.7, one of the really clear bits of this is the direction is the end point of the process. So you would never then look to have a direction issued until all parties had agreed that actually that was the way to deliver that particular service. So, you know, within that, if we were unhappy for any aspect of that, that's the point at which so you'd have those discussions and those negotiations before you brought the direction, you know, before you set the direction. And you'd have to keep going back to ensure that the direction that was being set was in line with what was deliverable and um, what we all had, had agreed. And I think that, for me, is, is the key point in that process, that it is the key point of the overall process, um, and you wouldn't get your direction until that point had been reached. But I, sorry, and then I truly okay. will shut up. Um, I think that's absolutely fine, and you've given us that verbal assurance, but we've got a draft report here, and it's not implicit within that that the, these safeguards are in place. It, it's quite, that particular paragraph, and don't even get me started on the phraseology of half of it, um, there's more negatives and double negatives in there than I can count, but that particular paragraph makes it seem very inflexible for delivery partners to, to do anything out with um, and it's great to have a verbal update, but it maybe needs to have a however in an instance where, or um, this will be agreed in full consultation with. Because reading this, you know, for the first time, I, it just it, it throws up a flag that they have no flexibility. Councillor Nicholson is at the same point. Well, I think you're, you're near the conclusion there, but I think you know whether it's you know a lot of things appear contradictory. In, in this, in these papers and uh, the previous paper, and how the, how they merge together, and perhaps that's a message that could go across uh, to the, the the IGB. This paper hasn't came in front of the IGB yet, so uh, I think you know. Whether, I don't know whether this is the paper they get or whether the comments and whether uh, you know additionality could be made in that. And uh, I listen to Heather saying, yes, yeah, she has an input into the directions and, and, and it's an agreement within there, but then that can be ignored. 
Yeah, I mean, and then to go forward. But I'm sort of trying to think of a reasonable way to go forward with this, given what we're what's in front of us today. But uh, I, I, I think it, probably members would seek a comfort or an assurance about what what um, what's inflexible and what is flexible, and maybe how we can represent that before this draft becomes agreed. Uh, now. Maybe that's really for IGB members to determine, but I'm sure uh, Lillian and Heather and whichever officers represent this council in that process um, can take that forward at the at the right level and maybe seek the assurance or what flexibility there is. Or just knowing that a direction shouldn't be a punitive uh, measure, but it's actually just setting out clearly what's expected of the partners. So I, I, don't, I think it maybe depends how you frame it, but um, I, I don't know if you maybe want to add to that, Lillian. Just to give members assurance that we'll take all the comments back today and we'll, we will absolutely um, ensure that these comments are incorporated into the draft document before it goes for final uh, tabling at the IJB. Absolutely. I'm going to regret this, but uh, Councillor Carruthers, uh, do you want to back in? Speak up 400 words a minute. I just think, is there a point for, for, for this committee that it should, should as part of the due diligence process that the Integrated Joint Board undertakes to come to a former direction, should this committee see that direction in draft format? That's all. If it, if it complies with the, with the timelines that are there. I mean, that, I mean, here the members are saying they're not seeing it, so there's a delegation to the officers, they're seeing it. Some of the members on this committee do see it, but so the gap that seems to be there for me is, will the members of this committee, being members of the council, uh, will the council see it in real terms? Before it goes through, maybe they should. They are involved. Maybe they should. Maybe they should. The timelines might might not allow that. Just what I'm hearing. I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure. I know. I mean, I, th I think obviously IGB meetings are published on the the website for that particular body. It's up to them to make that decision. It may be in our interest to to actually actively look at that. Um, that we have members of this council who are who represent on the IGB. Um, I'm sure if we needed to, we could see those. Whether or not this committee can do anything meaningful with that other than note it, maybe, or make some comments, I'm not really sure. But um, again, Lillian, do you want to come back in? Maybe the other way that um, if members had a particular interest in a direction that they were invited to attend the forum mm -hmm. that was discussing that, discussing that particular direction? Sorry? You'd need to know what the direction is in the first place, and this comes back to the previous report about understanding what is being delivered, where it's being delivered, and the directions that are therefore required. The, the, the directions will be reported on to this committee, so you would know those, yeah. yeah. But I think it's very much really what this is trying to set in place is the fact that up until now, we haven't had anything in terms of directions reported to this committee uh, explicitly like this, and that's really what we're trying to establish. Um, Councillor Wood, do you want a final shot? Yeah, one final shot, and that is these directions are legally binding. What are the penalties if they, they're breached? That, that would be for the, the um, Integrated Joint Board to come back to the local authority. But I would, I would um, give assurance that we would, we would work through um, any issues before we got to that point. Thank you. So... On, on that final point, I'm, I'm assuming then that those discussions would be in a mature and collaborative manner. Excellent way to finish there. Uh, so 2.1, if, if we're agreed to note the proposed process, 2.2 um, is the noting the existing directions issued to the local authority. 2.3 is noting the establishment of a regular monitoring process to ensure that directions issued um, are, are appropriately supported through delegated resources, and 2.4, that an annual report, I think this is where, uh, in previous discussions, we'd, we'd wanted to see that more regularly, so we were looking at something six monthly, um, just so that we can, be especially given the sort of uh, the time that it's taken to actually get the detail in front of us, um, if we can see that six monthly. And of course, Lauren has given the assurance that all the comments, um, salient points made here today can be raised in the appropriate way. Um, I don't think there's any additional uh, notes to add to the recommendations. Are we happy on that basis to go ahead? Yep, thank you very much. Item 7 is a, an item for noting, and that's the Public Protection Committee in minutes. So we're happy to, to note that. Uh, 
And um, that's it. No other business, you're free to go. Thank you very much for your uh, discussion today. It's been a valuable committee. Thank you.